I'm Pete. I'm Stephanie, and this is The Cool Part Show, our show all about innovative 3D printed parts. Additive manufacturing for sporting goods is something we've covered on the show before. But this club is different. It is a production part, it is a commercially available product, and it is approved for professional use. This club has a special geometry on the inside that delivers a performance improvement golfers wouldn't expect from a club this size and shape. If you think you know the story behind Cobra's latest 3D printed iron, stay tuned. We've got the engineering story. How additive manufacturing is changing golf clubs on this episode of The Cool Parts Show. This episode of The Cool Part Show is brought to you by Carpenter Additive. The company's Powder Life solution is a combination of hardware and software technologies designed to help AM users manage their metal powders. Stay tuned after the episode for more on how this system works. Welcome to The Cool Part Show. If you like what you see, make sure to subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can also sign up for our all access email to get notified about our new episodes even earlier. Today on the show, we are talking about the Cobra Puma Golf Limited Iron. This is a golf club that came to market earlier this year with a head that is made through metal 3D printing, specifically laser powder bed fusion. This club looks just like an iron that a professional golfer would use. It, it weighs the same as a conventional iron, but thanks to additive manufacturing and the changes that it brought to this club, it is much easier to hit a great shot with this club than with a conventional iron. Cobra Puma Golf has been using additive manufacturing for a while. There was an earlier 3D printed product, a putter. That one was made of binder jetting. We actually covered that when they brought it out, and we'll put a link in the show description. That was, among other things, kind of an exploratory project, figuring out additive manufacturing for production. As far as fully leveraging the potential of additive manufacturing for a significant design change, significant performance improvement, this club is a striking example of that. So, to hear more about this club, more about the company's journey with additive manufacturing, here is Cobra Puma Golf's Director of Innovation, Ryan Roach. We chose to develop the limited irons because we felt that there was a, a a hole in the market and we thought with additive we could fill that hole golfers want to play what the pros play but they're not as good as the pros so they have to play clubs that are designed differently and in doing so some of the attributes that golfers want to have that relate to that pro club are no longer there so you have to make a club bigger and it has to move the weight around it doesn't look as good it doesn't feel as good but it's easier for someone to hit with additive, we felt we could capture the best things that golfers want about a club that the pros will play, such as the look and the feel and impact, and combining that with the forgiveness and performance that a game improvement club would have. And that's something that, quote, you know, pundits in the industry said, hey, that's just not possible. So Ryan brings up this tension, balancing the size of the club versus its forgiveness. A professional golfer is more likely to use a club that looks like this, that's smaller, um, maybe offers better control, uh, higher launch, greater distance, whereas other golfers might choose a club that's bulkier than this but makes it easier to hit the ball. So I don't golf, I don't think you do very much either, Pete. So for this episode, we consulted a colleague who knows golf a lot better than we do. I wanna introduce the brand vice president for Additive Manufacturing Media, which produces this show. Um, his name is Rick Brandt, and in a past life, he was a golf pro, somebody who does equipment fittings and teaches golf in a club setting. So I left the golf industry in early 2000s, and at that time, I was managing a high-end daily fee golf club which was the commercial operations, uh, the um, tournament events. Uh, I was teaching and also doing club fittings, um, which was typically intertwined with giving golf lessons. So a standard set of golf clubs is 14 clubs, and that's made up of woods, irons, and a putter. The predominant volume of clubs in your bag are irons. Typically, a person has anywhere from 8 to 11 irons in their bag. And the purpose of an iron, uh, these are for your more precision golf shots. So these are usually approach shots to the green or shots uh, when you're hitting into a par three. So the goal of every golfer is to hit the golf ball in the sweet spot. And that's essentially the bullseye of the club face. 
And forgiveness in a golf club is consistency when the ball is struck outside of the sweet spot area. As you hit a golf ball more towards the toe, more towards the heel, a club tends to twist, there's vibration. And as you move further and further from the sweet spot, even in, in small amounts of a quarter of an inch to a half an inch, it greatly affects one, the distance of golf ball goes. So you could see distance dropping off of 10 to 15 yards, but it also imparts side spin and directional uh, inconsistencies, as well as it's a harsh feeling that you get back from the golf club. So if you've ever experienced swinging a baseball bat and hitting the ball near the handle of the club, or uh, some people hit tennis racket where you hit the ball towards the frame or towards the handle, you get this harsh vibration. Hitting the ball in the sweet spot is one of the greatest feelings in golf and you don't get that vibration and, and harsh impact. So how to get that sweet spot feeling? A couple options. Um, there are game improvement clubs that look different than this, different geometry that spread that sweet spot region around. By contrast, there are clubs, conventional clubs, that look just like this, but they are made through forging so that the club head is a solid piece of steel and the sweet spot is very targeted, very localized. And so, how to get a club just like this and spread the sweet spot around, get that forgiveness. And the solution is not so much a matter of light weighting, which we talk about a lot on this show, but it's more a matter of re-weighting, spreading the weight around within this geometry. Discretionary weight in terms of golf design is weight that is not needed to create the basic structure that would be durable. In the case of an iron, you need a face, you need a sole, you need something to put the shaft into. We call that the hosel area. And you need a certain target weight for that over that head in order to create the balance of the club that you need. And so there's, there's a spec for that weight. Let's call it 270 grams. Everything that you can take out that isn't necessary for that durability piece uh, is now discretionary for the designer to put wherever they want to in, in the design in order to create the mass properties that we want for that club head. So we want a low CG. We're going to take that extra weight and slam it all the way to the bottom of the club. Um, if we want to have something that's very forgiving, we're going to push that weight out to the outside of the club head. So we're always chasing for the ability to have as much of that as possible. So discretionary weight, the weight that the designer has the freedom to play around with um, up to and within the limits of the manufacturing process. So forging is going to impose certain design limitations. Casting might give you a little bit more freedom, but the great advantage that Cobra found with additive manufacturing was the chance to really take control of where that discretionary weight goes. And the solution that they found was actually to remove a lot of it with 3D printing and fill most of this club head with with lattices. The cool thing about the limited iron is with that internal lattice structure, we can take something that was solid and pull all that extra weight out and replace it with lattice. And that's the discretionary weight that the limited iron has that other clubs don't. And so that way we can take that weight and concentrate it, in this case, low down in the heel and toe of the club head. So again, not light weighting, but re-weighting. The club is made through laser powder bed fusion of 316L stainless steel, and the overall net weight remains the same as a conventional club. So that means all of that weight that is taken out by replacing what used to be solid steel with open lattice forms inside of that club, the weight has to be added back in somehow, somewhere else. And that happens during post-processing. We won't talk about post-processing much in this episode because as it happens, most of the post-processing steps are the same for an additive club or a conventional club. Plating, for example. But one post-processing step that is added here is the insertion of heavy tungsten inserts. Tungsten, heavier than steel, inserted to compensate for, balance, the weight that was lost through the lattice geometry. The effect is to move the center of gravity of this club much closer to the ground, and that is a huge factor in realizing this club's greater forgiveness. When you put it that way, like it sounds like kind of a straightforward problem, take the weight out, put it back in, 
But as they were figuring out how to do this, they had to be careful to maintain the stiffness and the strength of the outside of the club head. And it turned out that getting to just the right lattice was kind of tricky. It turned into an engineering problem and also a little bit of a computational problem. When it came time to design the inside of the head with the internal lattice, we found that we were, we were really getting into a bottleneck. The files, it was almost like debilitating, I would say. In other words, a file would slow down so much that you'd try to make one change and you'd have to wait and wait and wait. And so maybe it's a limitation of the software, maybe it's a limitation of our computing power, but that's why we searched for other tools that could do this better. And we landed eventually on NTOP as being uh, the best tool to design that internal lattice. So we had the outside shape done with NX and then the inside geometry, we used NTOP and its latticing capability and, let's, and its lattice analysis capability to create the internal geometry. NTOP has a built-in suite of lattice types um, that we were looking at and we started with a body centered cubic lattice. Uh, it was it's very lightweight. That was our starting point. And then as we analyzed things and made parts to test, we found out that we needed something that was stiffer uh, and stronger. So our journey ended up from the, you know, through several different lattice types uh, to a dodecahedron lattice. So I think it's important to understand that additive manufacturing, the process itself is not what makes this iron so special. It's the design capabilities that additive manufacturing allowed. So inside this golf club, you have a hollow lattice structure, which is very similar to when wood driver heads got oversized back in the mid nineties. You have a hollow head. You've condensed this technology into a small iron head, which is incredibly forgiving and a game enhancing club for golfers of any skill level. So I, I was thoroughly impressed with this club. I mean, I was fortunate to be in the golf industry in the mid to late nineties when large oversight drivers came out, which I think changed the game for many players. This is the next advancement in technology that I've seen that matches that. Um, I would say for me, it was like mentally confusing because when you look down, you see this beautiful club that looks like a forged blade, but it performs like a large cavity back for giving cast iron. It's, it's an amazing advancement in golf technology. For Cobra, this is just the beginning. Ryan talks about how within the company, with the realization of this iron, the view of additive manufacturing has really changed, uh, particularly among the engineers who will be realizing future transformative re-engineered products. Within our walls of our company, the attitude has changed quite a bit. One of the things that I think the made the limited irons so successful was that it wasn't a solution in search of a problem. It was a the technology applied to solve a problem. In this case, it was kind of, we call it an unspoken need, but sometimes that that's okay. As long as there is a, something, a gap that it's filling, it's either solving a problem that's exist that everybody knows about, or it's bringing something new that no one possibly thought was possible. And I think we're going to continue to look at using additive to make sure it satisfies one of those criteria. It's solving a problem or it's filling a gap that was there. As the name suggests, the limited iron was produced in an initial run of 500 sets. And we should say that in the development of this club, Cobra worked with, collaborated with the U.S. Golf Association as well as the Royal and Ancient Golf Club in the U.K. to ensure that these irons were going to adhere to their regulations to meet the standards for competition. And in fact, um, limited irons were used by at least one pro golfer in this year's British Open, probably more to come. And Cobra is going to continue to look for these opportunities, as Ryan says. They're going to be looking for places where additive manufacturing can let them bring a club, bring an option to market that golfers haven't had before. Let's recap. This is the Cobra Puma Golf Limited Iron. Looks just like a conventional forged iron. Um, same shape, same dimensions. The difference is on the inside. It's made through laser powder bed fusion to achieve a carefully engineered lattice form on the inside for weight removal from the club, but that weight removal is compensated to keep the weight the same with tungsten inserts that move the center of gravity lower. 
What makes this club so cool is this idea of discretionary weight. Designers have been limited with what they can do as far as moving weight around, but now with 3D printing, Cobra found this way to take the weight out, put it back where they wanted it, and get exactly the performance, exactly the way they wanted this club to play. The company learned other lessons about additive manufacturing, more directly related to engineering and production, and they applied those lessons learned in order to succeed with the manufacturing of the limited iron. Our All Access members got to hear Ryan talk about that. Additive manufacturing lessons learned that they've carried forward. If you would like to hear that, it's easy. Uh, joining All Access is free. It's simple to sign up, thecoolpartsshow.com slash allaccess. And if you have a cool part that you'd like to see featured, we'd love to hear about it. Please email us, coolparts at additivemanufacturing.media. Thank you for watching. Thanks again to our sponsor, Carpenter Additive. In addition to supplying metal powders, the company also offers services, software, and hardware to help AM users manage their powder. One example is the Powder Life System, a combination of cloud-based tracking software with hardware designed to make powder handling easier. Two key components are the Powder Life Hopper and the automated docking station. Luke Boyer, manager of Powder Life Applications, and Andrew Holiday, applications engineer, explained how the system works. So today, when a user of additive manufacturing is receiving powder, they oftentimes receive it in either 5, 10, uh, 15, maybe a 20 kilo uh, bottle. Um, but they're receiving pallets of them, and you're receiving 10, 20, 50, hundreds of, of these bottles. The user be, you know, has to look and, and, and segregate and store them uh, appropriately so the bottles don't get mixed up. And it requires a lot of lifting and, and moving and labor. The components of Powder Life are all based around making powder management systems on the added manufacturing shop floor easier to use for the operator, cleaner, as well as more traceable. Three of those basic parts of Powder Life are our Powder Life hoppers, or our storage containers for powder. The second would be automated uh, docking systems that allow material to be pushed in and out of machines with uh, no human contact. And the third would be our Powder Life online software system that allows you to trace this powder as it goes through your shop floor. The hardware, the software together, just helps really streamline that and, uh, and, and improve the final user's experience uh, and let them concentrate on going from design to the part itself. It takes the headache of powder management out of the equation for them.